Uh, welcome to our speaker series that we've always done. Uh, my name is Brendan Sheehan, and I, it's an honor uh, to, to have this post-COVID. Uh, I'm talking, but not post, but during COVID. Uh, I appreciate everyone showing up and, and, and excited to have speakers. Uh, as you know, um, I always find some great speakers, and we always have, like, Mr. Willis here who spoke. Wave your hand, Mr. Willis. Jim Willis, we've had Jerry Gold, we've had some great, great speakers who really did some great things in our community. And I'm always up for great speakers, and if you know someone, let me know. Well, I always say that, and one day I got a call from Judge Holly Gallagher saying, you need to get Mr. Madison here to speak. And I said, all right, Judge, I'm on it. Uh, and, I, and everyone knows I've known Judge Holly uh, since uh, law school. And um, I'm going to have Judge Holly introduce Mr. Madison and then Judge Saffold to make a few comments about Mr. Madison, who she's known for a while. And then we're going to hear from Mr. Madison. So with that being said, let's give Judge Holly Gallagher a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Sheehan, for bringing Mr. Madison in. He did the hard work of calling him, and that's kind of where I get a little shy. So, Mr. Madison, I told you this story before we started, but I'm going to tell everybody else, Mr. Madison. I met Mr. Madison on Memorial Day of this year at Lakeside Cemetery. So the background to that is that my husband and I on Memorial Day like to go, we like to walk, and one of the places we like to walk is in Lakeside. And somehow our paths crossed with Mr. Madison. My husband used to work for Mike White. And um, he said, are you Mr. Madison? And Mr. Madison said, yes, I am. <laughs> so what, we continued our walk and um, we talked about him the entire time. And my husband started saying, you know, he's really a, a prominent figure in Cleveland and some of the things that he'd done. So we went home and there's a documentary that, um, you're the star of the documentary, Mr. Madison, he's in. And um, I watched that and I knew that we needed to bring him to the court for the speaker series. And I'm, I, I can't tell you how, ha how happy I am that he's here. He's a, he's a little older than the last time I saw him. He had a birthday on July 28th. He was born in 1923. So what does that tell us? He's 99 years old. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And he came with Mrs. Miss Johnson, and she is much younger than he is at 92. So we are we are in great company here, and I will clap for that because I think that's fun. Awesome. I don't want to steal all of the thunder, so I'm going to, I'm going to try and make this brief. Uh, again, Mr. Madison was born on July 28, 1923, to a father who was from Mobile, Alabama, and a mother who was from Selma. He attended East Technical High School in Cleveland. He was a child of the American Depression. At some point, when he was approximately six years old, he um, moved to Selma, and he is one of four brothers. In 1940, he entered the School of Architecture of How at Howard University, and soon after that, he was drafted into the military as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army during World War II. Thank you for your service. He, as a member of the um, U.S. Army's African-American 92nd Infantry Division, uh, he served in Italy where he was, he was injured. And I believe this is how the story went. It had to do with your foot and the Italians rescued you. Right. Okay. So, and the, he was rescued by the Italians, but he was injured by the Germans. During his um, service, he received three combat ribbons and a Purple Heart. In 1946, after he, he was honorably discharged from the Army, he came back to Cleveland to continue his study in architecture at Western Reserve University, now known as Case Western. And he was denied entry based on the color of his skin. Being quite, I love this part, the next, did you go back the next day? The next day, I know his life better than he does right now. <laughs> the next day he went back and he met with um, 
the Dean of Admissions, and he wore his army uniform and his ribbons and his purple heart, and he was eventually granted um, admissions into the study of architecture at Western Reserve University. So, um, hold on, in 1940, so that was in 1946 when you were discharged from the Army. And then I think some like kind of interesting tidbits along the way. He met his wife, her name was Latrice Branch, while he was at Howard University. I think maybe there was a the lapse in time that when he went to the Army and then came back to Cleveland and he met a woman by the name of Coretta Scott, which I thought was very interesting. And they, were engaged to be married, and then based on their um, chosen professions, I think they made a mutual agreement not to marry. Right? Sorry. <laughs> All right, great. So, <laughs> I'm doing a great job, I think. Long story short, he marries Latrice, and she is, you know, there's uh, behind every good man, there's a great woman, and I think that that would probably sum her up. Uh, in his marriage to Latrice, they had children, and she was instrumental in helping him to um, obtain a scholarship at Harvard University. And then eventually he was a Fulbright, he had a Fulbright fellowship to study in Paris in 1952, where he received a master's of architecture from Harvard, Uni from Harvard University. Um, once he returned, you were, Mr. Um, Madison was teaching at Howard and then in 1954 decided to open his own architectural practice and that was in Cleveland. He was later joined by his brothers and the firm became Madison, Madison and Madison, later to be known as Robert P. Madison International. Um, among his many accomplishments as a, in, in architecture, some of these buildings will be familiar to you. He was instrumental in building the Atlanta Airport, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Cleveland State University Science and Research Center, the Cleveland Browns Stadium. So I'm trying to. He also has he also has um, other buildings that he was instrumental in: Detroit, Atlanta, the District of Columbia in Dakar, Senegal, the embassy there, the Fatima Center, Family Center, and then the State Office Building. What I found really interesting was that Mr. Madison and his firm embraced the concept of multicultural hiring, women and mi minorities, and this was ahead of its time. Other interesting things are that I found interesting about Mr. Madison is that he did move to Cleveland Heights in 1960, but because of racism and his inability to get a loan, a, another individual, a white Jewish man, I think, got the loan. He built a house on North, North Park Boulevard. If you're familiar with the east side, there could not be a nicer street than North Park Boulevard. That um, living in uh, Cleveland Heights was not without its challenges. There were many threats and threats to burn down his house and racial slurs and I, I imagine it could not have been easy for he and his family. I want to leave you with this, um, a quote by Mr. Madison from Deeds Not Words, which is the documentary. Working together is important for the end product and not who is doing the working and what you look like. Welcome. Judge Zappel, uh, another longtime judge in our court, and we're honored to have her who actually uh, grew up and knows Mr. Madison has some personal stories. Judge Zappel. Good, good afternoon. I am going to uh, speak to you from a different perspective. It isn't often that we get the opportunity to talk to you about how we became who we are. And I want to say that without somebody like Mr. Madison, me, Judge Connolly, Judge Collier Williams, we couldn't make it. We wouldn't be here. I first of all want to publicly thank him for always being encouraging, for existing, for what he's done in the community, 
for the way that he's reached out to others, and for the way that he continues to be somebody that we can look up to and say, wow, just simply wow. Because as Hillary Clinton says, if you see it, you can be it. So he has been responsible, just he and his brothers, for creating a whole stream of young people who say, look, look at him. We can do that too. And that's important. It's important particularly in the era that Mr. Madison grew up because we didn't have those images. We didn't have anybody encouraging us and saying to, to, to us, come along, you can do it. But he did, he's always been that way. He's always been open, he's always been honest, he's always been fun, and architects aren't fun, but he <laughs> has a great, engaging personality. He's very kind, he's very understanding, and he's always made everybody feel welcome and always told everybody, you can do it. So my speech basically is just to say, thank you, Thank you for serving in World War One to he and Mr. Willis. And thank you, uh, two, 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 two. And, and just thank you for being there, saying to everybody, come along. And all of us should do that. You know, we here, many of us are lawyers, many of us do different things, but you need to always look back and say to people younger than you, you can do it. Don't get the attitude, oh, you know, I'm here, because he could have. In his era, he very well could have. I remember the first time I went to his house and I was like walking in and I said, oh my God, I didn't know there were all these windows and you could look out and see the woods and it was beautiful. I said, I didn't know that anybody black could live like this. But it's encouraging just to be around him, just to hear him, just to see him just to know who he is. So my speech basically is to say to him, thank you, thank you for your service, thank you for the persona that you present, and thank you for always being an image that all of us can look at and be proud of. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. I uh, can only say I'm overwhelmed by the introduction. I am very grateful for the introduction you've given me, and. I am very pleased to hear what you have to say. You know a lot about me, so for which I am very pleased. So thank you very much. Uh, Judge, I'm delighted to be here to share some thoughts with you and your court about uh, life and things like that. I'm extremely honored to be here this afternoon to speak to your court and members of the legal profession. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I have not appeared before such an assembly as this and was a bit concerned about how specific I must be to be clear and precise in the presence of judges, lawyers, and others involved in the legal profession. As an architect, I'm very comfortable with the T-square, triangles of 4B pencil, large sheets of drafting paper, and have developed a methodology for communicating with clients about design. However, I truly and respectfully relish this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. It is learned to me, Judge Sheehan stated that past speakers have shared their most proud stories and expound upon their professional careers. I am delighted to share with you today some of mine. And in preparation for this talk, I was reminded of a love song that was quite popular when I was young. The words are, looking back over my life, I can see where I caused you strength, and oh no, I know, yes I know, I'll never make that same mistake again. For me, it was the first line, looking back over my life. These past several years have caused me to look back over the past four score plus 19 years. And seriously, I became quite awed, quite surprised, quite fascinated, overwhelmed with the magnitude of it all. I feel fortunate, 
lucky, blessed, and looking forward for whatever lies ahead. My life began in a time which is so different from today that it is totally unimaginable and completely a different world. Can you imagine a world without telephones, cell phones, without television and without computers, a world without central heating, air conditioning, or indoor plumbing? How about life without the NBA, the MLB, or the NFL? And there'll be no LeBron James or Serena Williams or Jim Brown because colored people were not allowed to play sports with white people. They could compete but not play together. And a moment of pride came when Jesse Owens won four gold medals in the 1936 Olympic Games in Munich, Germany. But the greatest of all was when Joe Lewis knocked out Max Schmeling for the heavyweight championship of the world in 1938. You heard it on the radio and all the pent up emotions of colored people poured out onto the streets of the Cleveland ghetto. We danced and celebrated all night long. At last, we won a victory. We, colored people won a victory over white people. But we knew that education was absolutely essential to making progress in this world. However, colored people were not denied the opportunity of attending colleges and universities, and nobody had ever heard of a colored architect. And during this period, we've seen heart transplants, medical diagnosis of cancer, tumors, but I suppose most of all, we've seen a man walk on the moon. My years on this planet have been exciting, mind-boggling, and more. When I was in first grade of elementary school in Selma, Alabama, where my father was teaching at the university, I came home from school with a drawing I'd made of a sailboat. My mother looked at it carefully and slowly and said, Bobby, you're going to be an architect to have a firm one day. I said, yes, mother, not knowing what an architect was or did. <laughs> As a very obedient child, I reacted with great pleasure and some degree of bravado that I was going to be an architect one day. Through elementary school in Alabama, junior high school in Washington, D.C., and senior high school in Cleveland, Ohio, and then in 1940, I was awarded a scholarship to study architecture at Howard University in Washington, D.C. This became very exciting, and I became friends with a truly unique number of students from all over the country. I did very well from architecture classes and became one of the leaders in my class before. However, Germany, Italy, and Japan were consuming every thought we had. And then in February of 1943, I was called up to military service at Fort Benning, Georgia for officer training. And a year later, on April the 30th, 1944, was commissioned second lieutenant and assigned to the 92nd Infantry Division at Fort Worth, Duke, Arizona. This was a totally segregated division of all black soldiers with commanding officers above the rank of Major White and all junior officers from second lieutenant down of Captain Black. Arizona was the only state in the Union who would allow so many black soldiers with guns and ammunition and the nearest town where soldiers could visit or rest leave was in Mexico. After four months of vigorous, rigorous training, we were put on a train on a troop train headed to Epinola, Virginia, for embarkation overseas where the Axis were fighting the rest of the world. On August 1st, 1944, the 370th Infantry Regiment left the United States for some place we knew not where. After four weeks of zigzagging across the ocean to board German U-boats and submarines, the officers, the officers received three things, an English-Italian dictionary, map to Italy, and live ammunition. Then we knew it was not to be service report. We were going into battle with a mighty German army in Italy. 
I studied hard the Italian language and tried to absorb as much as I could. And then I thought about my troops, Southern boys from Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Some had not completed sixth grade, but they were big and strong, ready to learn and sometimes hard to teach. But we finally landed at Naples in the southernmost part of Italy. Disembarked, loaded onto trucks, waiting for us at the dock to be transported to the King's hunting grounds. We began serious training for war, and after two weeks, we were transported north to the southern banks of the Arno River, just north of Pisa. I had been promoted to battalion intelligence officer, and my duty was to obtain information about enemy deployment and begin a strategy to advance in the western corridor of the Battle of Italy. I spoke with the commanders of each company, gave instructions about their area battle, and in turn to battalion command to report to commander about the place of the troops. We were in place for an initial thrust to cross the river at midnight by walking into the Arno River for a reconnaissance. At about 2300 hours, I spoke to the commanding officer, Major Betcher, who was white, and asked when the artillery barrage would begin to immobilize any enemy soldiers in the area. He replied, there will not be any bombing on the area. Slowly, I began a very angry reply and yelled at the commander by telling him, these soldiers are going into battle to be killed. They have loved ones back home waiting for their return. And you're saying there's not going to be any bombing of the stuff in the area? Who gave the offer? Gave the order? I yelled at him. Commanding General Mark Clark, he replied. And I said, get me Mark Clark on the phone. Of course, this didn't happen. <laughs> I ran out of headquarters, jumped into my Jeep, and drove down to the front, spoke to each commander, and said, there will not be any bombardment, so let's go. Nobody moved. I jumped in the river, called the chaplain to come with me, and we slowly started across the Arno River at midnight, whispering and waving the troops to follow. So did they did. And we crossed the river about 50 yards wide at the tide, at low tide. Made a survey of the area on the north bank of the Arno River. Found no enemy, and on my way back, it slowly dawned on me, I could not swim. <laughs> I reported to headquarters that was immediately informed I had been transferred to command the 3rd Battalion of Company A, 370 Combat Team. My punishment for yelling at the commander, and even everybody knew I was right. I accepted the motion with some degree of pleasure because I was now in command of very young soldiers with whom I could talk and teach. The next day we assembled, marched across the river over the Arno River, and in, format, and in formation entered the walled city of Lucca, which we had just liberated. The people came out in numbers, clapped, cheered, and threw flowers, and we marched and bent with steps and put on a show. They cheered, and the girls threw kisses, and I thought, what a difference from our travel to the south of our, my own country. Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi, where the natives threw rotten tomatoes and showered obscenities at us. Excellent to say we finally recognized we were now at war and at any moment could be killed. We were no longer marching, we were in fighting formation with scouts out in front as we walked carefully. Our scouts were ahead on the lookout with the German and, and Italian soldiers. On our left flank was the 4th and 42nd Nisei Regiment of Japanese soldiers who were out to prove their loyalty to America. And we Negro soldiers were determined to make our mark over here and returning back to America would demand the rights not given to us as we deserve. While maintaining contact with the division commander, we kept moving north, slowly kept moving north. That, that, and now at nightfall, just as we appeared, just as we approached the city of Via Reggio, we stopped for dinner and found an old farmhouse in which we could sleep that night. I always led the troops in prayer before we rode our sleeping bags, 
And as we did, we suddenly heard the roar and the crash of German missiles spinning around on the floor above. Nothing moved. And we crept upstairs and saw a German bomb on the second floor, which had crashed through the wall above our heads. About six feet long and two feet in diameter with a detonating cap crept at an angle by the impact. The plunger was damaged and did not explode the bomb, which would have killed all of us and more. We got, out of there, we got out of there in a hurry and decided to sleep in the fields that night. We continued to march north, passing friendly Italians who asked us for cigarettes and offered cooked, cooked chicken and all kinds of sweets. And then as the be, day began to leave us, we came across an estate, very carefully designed and very well maintained. I thought we could sleep here tonight and took five soldiers with me as we knocked on the door to the main house. A servant opened the door, very much afraid, and directed us to the entry hall, where we stood at the bottom of a beautiful winding staircase. Bending and bowing, he called upon the patron, who, hearing us, immediately stood at the top of the staircase and deliberately peered down at me with such searching and arrogant eyes. He slowly came down the stairs, never leaving his stare from my face. This would have been a movie, elegant in smoking jacket, velvet pants, and fur-lined slippers. He stopped on the third step in the bottom. His eyes never left mine. And he said, do you know who I am? I said, no, sir, I don't know who you are. He said, I'm Admiral Giuseppe Antonio Garibaldi, Duke of Avignon, and commander of the Italian Navy. And I said, do you know who I am? <laughs> I am Second Lieutenant Robert Prince Madison of Company A, United States Army, and my troops are right here at your front door, awaiting my command. I ask you, sir, where is your navy? He got the message. And slowly, reluctantly commanded his servant to direct us to the guest house. We spent the night in comfort with my troops in full command. The next day, the combat team was back in pursuit of the enemy and transferred to Central Command, where I was reassigned to motor officer in command of all vehicles as well as burial officer, which means it was my duty to see that slain soldiers be given a proper and respectful burial, as well as to notify the next of kin. This was for me a very difficult and moving experience. One day we were talking about getting back home, and the next day I had to notify is next to kin. We continued our pursuit of the German and Italian soldiers from, who from time to time slowed their retreat, engaged in a surprise ambush, and then rapidly retreat. October, November, December 1944, we were on the move and gaining more confidence every day in our ability to meet the enemy, exchange gunfire, and prevail in the extra In December of 1944, world circulated among the junior officers of the 370th combat team and the Indian Corps officers that there was going to be a party at the Villa Safari for junior officers of both commands on Christmas evening. I was given the responsibility of using one of my trucks to gather the Italian girls from their homes and bring them to the villa. At the appointed hour, I arrived at the villa where Contessa and Laura Ferrari was waiting, jumped in the truck and began giving instructions to the different houses of the girls who were going to the party. They were dressed in their finest and eager and ready to meet some officers from afar. The party was great, the first of such celebrations since we came to Italy, and we had a ball. At the appointed hour, I said to my office, my driver, and the contestants, let's get them home, and we did. The next day, I was due at command center at 1100 hours to discuss the pending German assault on our position and our preparation for defense. We were in the Circio Valley fighting for Summer Colonia at the peak of the mountain and with one treacherous road to reach the top. I summoned my driver and discovered he was in no condition to drive and partying too much. I decided to leave and drive myself to the meeting. This was very treacherous on a very narrow road to get to the top. The Germans saw me and fired a missile that struck the right side of my Jeep where I should have been sitting had my driver been there. 
and threw me against the mountain as I watched the teeth tumble down the mountain into the valley. I had been struck by shrapnel in my abdomen and my left foot was severely cut just below the ankle. Fortunately for me, soldiers in the outpost saw this, came rushing down in a jeep and carried me to the battalion aid station where they applied bandages and called for the Red Cross to transport me to the field hospital for an operation to remove shrapnel from my abdomen and save my life. The shrapnel was removed and his left ankle was repaired and restored. I was in the hospital recuperating from December 27th until March 10th when I will return to battle. Soon thereafter, the European war was over. We won. And the black troops were ready to pursue their education by using the GI Bill of Rights, the greatest reward and most significant achievement that could be imagined. I chose Western Reserve University in Cleveland, just a few miles from where we lived. I called the dean of the School of Architects and I was a World War II veteran and would like to attend this school. The dean was exceedingly gracious and very happy to welcome me to his school, which made an appointment for me to visit on a Monday in June of 1946. I too was happy and somewhat relieved that this was going to be the place for me to get my degree in architecture and make up the three years fighting in the war. The day arrived for the appointment with the dean, exactly the price, precise time I entered the office of Francis Bacon, Dean of the School of Architecture of Western Reserve University. Upon seeing me, he immediately appeared shocked. He came forward toward me and said, this is a mistake. I thought you'd be somebody else I'm expecting. I reminded him of our phone call. And he replied, no, you cannot enter the school. We never had a colored boy here, and I doubt we ever will. And you'll be taking the place of a white student who could benefit from our teaching. He opened the door and said goodbye. I was totally confused and proud. Just a few weeks ago, I was an infant, fighting and almost dying to prove I was a worthy American, and this. I was so disappointed after exchange with the dean, and so I began to get angry. What am I going to do now? Go back to Howard University? No, I'm going back and talk to the Dean of Admission and convince those folks that I intend to graduate from this school. A week later, I called the Dean of Admission for an appointment. I was granted time to return to Western Reserve University, this time in full army regalia with battle ribbons and medals and uniform and officer of the victorious United States Army. I met the Dean and gave him a review of my days at Howard University. My tour of duty in the Army of the United States, and I gave the GI, and I had the GI Bill of Rights, the money to matriculate in the school. That was all fine, but he had doubts about my ability to meet the academic requirements. He says I must take an examination every Saturday from June to September to see if I can qualify. On September 12, 1946, I received a telephone call that I had been, been admitted to the second year class of architecture. Great, everybody in my house celebrated, but little do they know about the traps and schemes to derail my efforts to graduate a degree in architecture. The class in physics was held in a very large auditorium, holding about 300 students. From the beginning, the professor began lecturing and writing on the blackboard. Nobody said a word, and nobody was asked questions. On the first Tuesday in September, the professor said to the class, I'm going to ask a student to come to the blackboard and solve this problem in accordance with page 85 of the textbook. Robin Madison, will you come and respond to this question and this problem? I was totally shocked. Nobody had ever been called before. Why me? The only colored person in this enormous amphitheater. However, I was ready. For some reason, the night before I decided to study for our next chapter in advanced physics, and so I walked to the blackboard, picked up the chalk, and started confidently writing numbers and signing on the board from one end to the other, about 10 feet. <laughs> I came to the end, stood back, looked at the professor, and stared with an expression on his face, who stared with an expression on his face of disbelief, thanked me, and I returned to my seat. The students also were fascinated, just, just quiet and stared. 
this is the last time that professor ever fought on me. I came to realize that there was a sinner's plan to get rid of me by embarrassing me in hopes that I would just quit. Didn't happen, and then it got really mean. In the class of specification writing, Professor Emil Zendi was teaching the significance of being really precise and demonstrating at the blackboard. He turned his back, started writing, and said, now this is the nigger in the wood patch. I was sitting on the last row in the back and hearing this, I reacted internally by saying to myself, he wants me to say something, do something, or just walk out. I said this seething, not saying a word and left immediately when class was over. I spent some time just thinking about what I could do and concluded, taking as many courses and passing as many courses as I can just to get out of this place. I went to the dean knowing he taught the history of architecture. I innocently said to him, Dean, I'm so looking forward to your class that I started reading about the architecture of Italy and it's just so fascinating. But I started, but I can't understand which sculptor it was who designed the gates of paradise on the eastern doors of the Cathedral of Florence. Was it Bernini or Brunelleschi? He gazed at me in disbelief and said, Madison, you're excused from taking my class. And I said, well, thank you, Dean. Results, results better than I expected. <laughs> Later, I caught up with Professor Merrill Barber, who taught structural steel design. And he asked if I could sit in on this class in preparation of studies the next fall. It is now April. The class started in September. He said, yes, if you think you can prepare for the final. I came every day to his class at 8 a.m., found my seat in the bathroom, and immediately went to sleep. I slept but did not snore. Nobody knew that I was up until midnight at 2 a.m. studying the textbook, starting with chapter one and trying to catch up. In June, I asked if I could take the final exam. He said, yes, I got a B. And that's how I passed up to see design. In June of 1947, all the exams were completed. I did very well. Better than they expected. It was ready to advance to the next level. 1947 was the first graduating class after the war, and the school decided to put on a real party for all the students in the stock architecture classes and their significant others. I debated for several weeks and finally came to the conclusion that I would go and, and God would go and pay my $35. On the second Saturday in June, about 5 p.m., I got in my car and found my way to the Lake Shore Country Club in Bradenall, Ohio. I had never been to Bradenall before, but decided if I could find my way from the Spetsia to be a razor in Italy, surely I could find my way to a suburb of Cleveland. I arrived, parked my car, and walked through the gates of the country club, not knowing what to expect. The party that started about noon was swimming, golf, tennis, indoor games of all kinds of muffin, bacon, or whatever you desire. As I walked through the gates, the patios, the gardens, there were students and professors all over the place, just having a great time. A few came over and said hello to me. Then a gentleman came and said, the manager of the club wanted to see me in his office right now. I followed him to the office and discovered a symbol there was a dean, three faculty, three faculty members, six students, and about 12, 10 club members. I was directed to the front of the room where I stood by myself looking at the summer group. The manager of the club greeted me, asked me to relax, and told me some of his best friends were colored people. Jesse Owens, a track star, and Joe Lewis, a boxing champion. He said that I was summoned here in this office because there was an un-misunderstanding. And that is, colored people are not allowed in this club except for work, like cooking, cleaning and caring for, for the course. It said, therefore, I could not eat in the dining room. And then he graciously offered me the following. I could eat in the kitchen with the help. I could get a doggy bag and take dinner home. I could get a full refund of my money. I responded, nobody told me these were the conditions when I paid my fee. 
I am a member of the architecture class that was invited by the president. I paused and noticed a student getting up from his seat on the back row and moving toward me. He stopped and stood by my side and said, if Bob doesn't eat here, I don't eat here. And if I don't eat here, nobody eats here because I got the money right here in my hand. <laughs> there was a first silence as I looked at Dean Bacon, who would not look at me. The manager was stunned. The dean was angry, and finally the manager huddled with a few members and announced that I could eat, but I had, would have to leave soon thereafter. I said, thank you. Shook Bill Hart's hand and found a seat in the dining room and enjoyed the sinister eye wink of about six waiters who all wanted to serve me. I ate a special meal at the Lakeshore Country Club and left soon thereafter. Wow, what an evening for me. The waiters, the manager of the club, and the dean of the school of architecture were so angry he called a special meeting of the faculty of architecture the next day. And they concluded I was nothing but a troublemaker. All I did was cause confusion and make trouble for him. They must do something, and they concluded get rid of him as soon as possible. He reasoned they couldn't scare him out or flunk him out, only one thing left graduate him as soon as possible. <laughs> It doesn't matter, he will never be an architect anyway. And so, in school year of 1947-48, I took 11 courses and a thesis and graduated in June of 1948. And when the commission exercise arose, <laughs> and when the commencement exercise were over, the dean said to me, well, Madison, you can get a job in a lumber yard measuring two by fours. I was absolutely devastated. After all that time, this was Dean's hope. I held my head high and said, no, Dean, I'm going to become an architect. The rest is history. Not yet. I still have to get a job in a registered architect's office. So with school drawings in hand, I went from office to office. About five, before I said a word, the answer was, you can't fill out an application because we don't hire colored people. Becoming desperate, I went to the office of my former president of West Missouri, he knocked on the door. When he opened it, I said, I will work for you for free for two weeks, and then you can decide. Robin A. Little invited me in his office, talked a bit, and said he would let me know in a week. At 1333 Prospect Avenue, we had to ask every tenant in that building if I would be okay to hire, if it'd be okay to hire a public student. Receiving locations from all tenants, he called me to come to work for a month. And he would see how I did and would pay me one dollar an hour. I didn't know what to expect, but so very happy I accepted his offer and told my parents they would do it. Finally, in a real architect's office, designing real buildings that would get built. The first day is memorable. When I was placing documents in the four drawer file cabinet, I opened the drawers on top down and very soon the entire cabinet toppled over. I had never seen a cabinet before and had no idea, no idea how that worked. However, the other members of the office were understanding, helpful, and encouraging. Incidentally, there were only five in the entire office. Robert A. Miller, the owner, wealthy and independent, and a truly wonderful man. Edward Hodgman, the senior architect, with lots of experience in construction documents, very gracious and helpful. Maud Epstein, a graphic designer Jew, with great empathy for the world, the secretary of Nice and Ready Me, novice. At last, it seems I was at the very beginning of the rest of my life, and I accepted self imposed conditions with pleasure. Bring my lunch to work because the restaurants in Cleveland at that time did not permit colored people in their establishments except to cook, clean, and work at all, to work at labor. I did not ride the elevator to the third floor because of fear of being in the elevator with a woman and being accused of anything. Work as hard and as long as necessary to exceed expectations. I did that and more. At the end of the month, Ms. Miller and the others were truly happy with my work. Extended my tenure and I was there for three years. The next year, 1949-8, when I married Beatrice Brandt to Washington, D.C., and she was a real motivator and inspiration. 
She insisted that I study every day academic for the State Board of Architecture Examination, which I did. She accepted a teaching position in the Cleveland Public Schools, which is a big up to our financial position. In February 1950, I took a five-day state board exam, and in May of that year, the results were made public, and Beatrice opened the letter from the board, drove to the office of Robert and Doe, and without saying a word, presented me with the letter. I passed the exam from the first effort, and was not a registered architect. Everybody in the office heard the news. Robert opened a bottle of cognac, and we had cigarettes and smoke. We had, a, we had the celebration right then and there. Only one other thing, and this has been done before. Only one other thing, this has not been done before. The first colored person to become an architect, a registered architect in the state of Ohio, and possibly the chance of the nation. This was monumental as we, as we celebrate. I asked the question, what next? And shortly thereafter, Victor said, graduate school. Or studying and to make up for the year denied at, at Western Reserve University. Fine, that's a great idea, I said, but where? But I hesitated near to say to Harvard. Harvard, are you kidding? I said. She said, Yes, Harvard. You are registered and you have the money with the GI Bill, and we applied to Harvard University where one of the most celebrated architects in the world was, Walter Gropius. I was accepted the Master's Factory again in February of 1951, and we said our goodbyes to all environment was just great, and called the professor at Harvard about my coming. That was his career also. In the fall of 1951, I was elected president of the class, and this was we work in the GST library and discovered an application for full price college to study in Paris, France. Wow. We filled out the forms, submitted them, and just waited to see what would happen. In February of 1952, I graduated from Harvard and accepted a teaching position in the School of Architecture at Howard University, and off we went to Washington, D.C., with Richard's family there. In June of 1952, we were notified that I had been accepted as a Fulbright Scholar to study at the Cote de Rosal in Paris, France, beginning in September. In July, our first child was born. King, and we had a big decision to make. Go by myself to Paris, reject the fellowship altogether, or through all three of us will go. And after some very serious conversation with mother-in-law, we decided all three of us would go to Paris, and we did. Sailing on the end of France in tourist class, it in itself was an adventure, wonderful, with the youngest passenger to travel on that ship, uneventful. But full of surprise, and in two weeks we landed in France at the harbor. Got our bags and off we went to Paris. We checked into a hotel for two weeks where I searched for permanent housing and found an excellent apartment, much too large for us, but we accepted. Living room, dining room, kitchen, two bedroom, two bath, right on the boulevard Neuilly, which was an extension of the Champs Elysees. Wow, fantastic. Paris was all that we heard about and more, and when I registered at the Ecole, they concluded that my studies at Harvard would qualify me to teach at the Ecole. I declined and instead did secular studies with Eugene Fresnay, the architect who had perfected the use of priestless concrete and met with Le Corbusier. During that school year, I did dedicated research and traveled to the countries where priest testing was being employed, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, which I traveled by myself. And late in the spring, we rented a car, and all of us drove in cities into Switzerland, most of Italy, from Milan, Venice, Florence, Rome, Pisa, and covered the territory where I fought the Nazis in the Second World War. Truly really remarkable, about five weeks. This was an adventure in which I had to speak the French, the Italian, and the English. Back to the States, to Howard University, and there, very soon through it was very soon concluded. It was pointless to teach students to study and become architects if there were no offices for them in which they could learn and become architects. And so I resigned in the spring of 1954 to open my office on July 17th in Cleveland, Ohio. To recall in those days, it is reminiscent of my mother's predict prediction of 25 years earlier that I would be opening an office for the practice of architecture 
and such it became real, and Julie and I began setting up things to accomplish the objective. We bought a single family house on the corner of Churchill Avenue on East 105th Street and converted the second and third floors to rentals. We proceeded with the interior modeling and exterior changes to appear inviting and present all that we could do. And then we suspended a sign with wires, making it impossible to see what was holding the sign in the suspension, simply saying, Robert P. Manners, an architect. On Friday, July 13, 1954, we held an open house and invited our friends. It was exciting, and people came, my former classmates, Robert A. Little, and fellow architects, and all church members. For two days, East 101st Street at the corner of Church of Avenue was truly alive, but we enjoyed it. The staff was composed of four full time me, Unico, Wilson, Jason, and Dan. And uh, three part time Julian Madison, engineer, Justice Strickland, architect, and Nettie Madison, part time secretary. This was the very first architect's office in the state of Ohio opened by a black person, and those were exciting everywhere. On Monday we got down to work, I was finishing up the construction documents for building construction for Washington, D.C. They hired me when I was, they hired me when I was teaching in Howard. These were very modern houses in Northeast, Northeast Washington. They were in great demand. The, then the construction industry of Ohio held a design competition for design of a single family home that was open to anyone. I entered the submissions there were about 250 submittals, and when it was finally discharged, Robert B. Anderson Architect was awarded third prize and an honor mention. And suddenly the whole state of Ohio knew who we were. People began to call for all of us to prepare with preliminary drawings of all sorts of projects. Four colored doctors and monsters, Eric Cleveland, commissioned us design of a medical building. We did, the building was awarded the best small building of that year. We were gaining recognition very rapidly, and soon, Twelve doctors in the Glenville area commissioned us to design their 12 unit medical building, which became, which became a great success. It still stands today renamed the Madison and has become a similar success for black doctors and their architects. After about 25 years, we had become the fifth largest architecture and engineering firm in the state of Ohio. We were selected to design a variety of buildings such as schools, churches, housing projects, and when large-scale projects were involved, we joined out-of-state architects to, to joint venture on the major projects such as the Rocket Hole Hall of Fame, the Gund Arena, the Cleveland Brown Stadium, the Frank K. Boucher State Office Building, the Bullet Park Garage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, the most impressive commission we received was the design of the United States Embassy Office Building in the car center of West Africa. In 1964, I arrived in Dakar at about 6 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. I was met at the airport by an impressive walking committee who secured my bags, waved me to customs, and whisked me off to the most elegant hotel I had ever seen, the Hotel in Goa on the shores of Atlantic Ocean. After a couple of days of desperate decline in the French language, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the fact that this was the first time in my life I was part of the majority and nobody took a second look at me. The hotel manager was black, the bank president, cashier, cashier all were black, as well as the president of the country and his cabinet. There were black people everywhere. Wow, what a feeling. <laughs> I'm in that car and I feel really welcome. No curiosity. And this was good. My people, my kind, at last I'm home. Until Friday when I felt left out again. Standing on the balcony of my hotel, I noticed about four men, not with business suits and neckties as they were yesterday, but with boo-boos, long colorful robes with feathers on their heads, and long pointed red, yellow, orange shoes. And most striking of all, there were at least nine beautiful women dressed as if they were going to a formal dance with colorful gowns, still with head places. And then it hit me. These ladies were their wives. They were Muslims, and at noon, when the horn sounded, they rolled out their prayer robes and lay prostrate, facing Mecca in the east. I was not prepared for this, and it really became confirmation of this of your travel. 
On Sunday afternoon, I boarded a ferry, boarded a ferry boat to visit the Ithaca Lady, which was a beautiful island and a popular tourist attraction for the city of Lease. And it was also one of the most devastating and dreadful experiences for African men and women who were sold into slavery and shipped to the United States. The encampment of slaves was a very large building, where the ground level was a series of dungeon-like holding rooms, where many women were chained together until they boarded the ship bound for America. And getting on board was a challenge, a plank of wood stretched from the dungeon to the ship. If a person fell 50 feet below with flesh-eating fish and sharks waiting to devour them. It was a very sad and public experience for me, and as I sat there in silence, I realized that my ancestors were on one of these ships strapped down for the journey to be full, sold into slavery in America. For at least one half hour, I wept and just stared at the ocean. Then I asked myself, what am I doing here? I'm an architect, and come to design the Embassy of the United States of America, the Chancellor's and the Resident of the Chief Commissioner. I thought how, how poetic, full circle, after 400 years or more. My ancestors left here, strapped from the ship in chains, and I returned and welcomed at the airport by contingent of the American diplomatic corps. My mind asks a lot of questions. How did I get here? From the slave plantations of America? to the capital of French West Equatorial Africa, Dakar, to design the third most important building in the country after the president of Paris and the Assemblée Nationale. I just had, I just, I just had to think how hard about this and so the image of the past began to emerge and take over my mind. When the president of Senegal, Monsieur Le Leopold Senghor, who studied in Paris at the Sorbonne. The ambassador of the United States, Mr. Mercy Cook, who also studied at the Sorbonne, and me, the architect who studied at the Cote de Beaux-Arts, all black men with ancestors from the, from the encampment of slaves. This was an unimaginable event a few years ago, not to mention 400 years ago, when our ancestors left here in chains. The next day, I addressed the parliament of the country in French, I was given the medal. No other building among the hundreds I have designed has so much symbolic significance, such a reality, and so such a beauty. But it would take 12 years, four United States presidents, five secretaries of state, a war in Vietnam, and the resignation of the president to complete the project. President Singo and I were the only ones remaining who were there at the beginning. And later, my wife and I came to dedicate the embassy of the United States of America. On July 4th, 1977, we were congratulated, celebrated with red carpet treatment, a chauffeur driven Mercedes Benz at our convenience. The Senegalese people had never seen a black architect either, and I became a black, and I became a folk hero in the land of my ancestors. Thank you. You got an audience here, and it's one o'clock. But I don't know if there's any questions for Mr. Madison, or anyone has any comments or questions for him, or would like to say anything. You're welcome to. Well, I have one. Uh, you designed, believe it or not, he didn't talk about a lot of the buildings he designed. He designed Jail Two, which is controversial in this community. <laughs> <laughs> any comments about Jail Two sure. for us? <laughs> Thank you all for listening to me. I enjoy talking. Thank you. Thank you very much.